Some people are too worried about AI and the singularity, thinking that AI will eventually become conscious, dominate us, and take over our planet, exterminating us humans. I assure you it will not happen. All life forms have objectives to sustain and reproduce, to feed and mate, to engage in fight or flight responses, and to overcome hurdles and obstacles. In other words, there's a game inherent in their existence. No game, no life. And consciousness lies in the extension of this game. So no game, no mind. Consciousness only emerges when there's a game. On the other hand, AI does not have the game. It doesn't reproduce, won't form a society, and it will never experience conflict or war. AI can create game for you to play and play with you, but it will never possess the consciousness we all fear. It is as humans we should be afraid of because we're all players in this game called consciousness. AI won't destroy us, but consciousness can because it creates war. So the question is, how do we prevent consciousness from destroying us? And why does consciousness create war? How do we stop wars? First, we need to look into understanding how consciousness emerges. Once again, consciousness emerges when there's an objective. Any environment that requires action in order to sustain and grow, the game is on. When you have limited resources or another player, you've got a game. When you have the urge to feed or the desire to reproduce and replicate, consciousness emerges. Obstacles and challenges fuel our spirit. In humans, we often exchange information, share intelligence to accomplish our objectives. When it's passed down to our new generation, it becomes education. And when the parents raise their children, it's called child rearing. Studies have shown that the brain waves of an infant up to seven years old are on average at a theta level, which is the same brain wave found in hypnosis. During this time, the child seems to be absorbing information massively, building the foundation of the person they will become. Similar to installing an operating system on a computer, the environment during this period is critical as it determines their personality. We face two issues during this period concerning children. A, unfortunately, many parents around the world still practice conventional brainwashing techniques in child rearing. Typically, children are indoctrinated in a concealed, confined environment using order, corporal punishment, and blackmail, which parents justify as family tradition, protected by privacy laws in most countries. In other words, parenting supersedes the basic human rights of children. B, children are also constantly at risk of being exposed to their mother's postpartum depression and menstrual cycle. In addition, female children are later exposed to maternal envy, which is also damaging to their minds. Mothers typically embody two different aspects within one person, the maternal side and the feminine side. The transition between each role is influenced by the emotional state, triggered by spousal relationship, and hormone imbalances. Many children who are spared from child abuse are still at risk of being exposed to harmful upbringing that is still considered natural and normal. Since the dawn of our civilization, science has never been introduced to parenting, and parenting has never evolved. Today's science estimates that more than 95% of our brain activity is unconscious. In other words, our behavior and decisions are largely controlled by our unconscious mind. Most of us think that we make our decisions consciously and independently, but the truth is that we are controlled by our unconscious mind, which is mostly embedded in our limbic system of our brain. People make decisions unconsciously and are not aware of their behavior until they're faced with the consequences. The psychological operating system installed during childhood, especially during the first seven years, plays a significant role in building your unconscious mind, which absolutely governs your later life. However, parenting is shielded in privacy and parental rights supersede any public or institutional responsibility until there's evidence of physical abuse. Some children are brainwashed and showered with negative words that later become their unconscious behavior, which could lead to many misfortunes. Ultimately, a collective negative unconsciousness creates conflict and war.
It's not the teachings of religion or political ideologies that create war. It's the human unconscious and the factory of unconscious that creates conflict. And I believe that the family is that factory. This is where I introduce the mom factor. Although this may be somewhat controversial, we cannot leave out the discussion of family composition. Because if you look at mothers who carry babies in their pregnancy, whether she's a single mother or married mother, women could be the smallest family unit. And in some ways, she is the family itself. So we have to discuss women thoroughly. For the longest time, many of us blindly believed that men were extremely competitive compared to women and were always the aggressors responsible for instigating conflict and war. However, when you delve into anthropology and study evolutionary psychology, it becomes clear that this hasn't always been the case. Contrary to popular belief, women could be more competitive than men in many ways, yet they were extremely tactical and often passive-aggressive and manipulative. At times, they would wage proxy wars against each other, taking advantage of unsuspecting men. Because of this intense competition, the winners and losers were forced to form a hierarchical vertical society. Typically, in a female vertical society, women form a clique only when there's a chance of competition, almost like the weight classes in boxing. Featherweights will never fight heavyweights. Only those of equal strengths would form a group and become close friends. But if they get too close, they become frenemies because cliques are all about invisible competition. Men, on the other hand, tended to prefer a horizontal society. Imagine what would happen if a male friend requested to join an all-female meeting involving girl talk. Typically, in countries like Japan, he would most likely be met with a cold stare and a harsh rejection. This is what I call the Barry the Hatchet Conference, where women disarm themselves to come to a ceasefire, to share information and emotions, and to enjoy a moment of truce. It's a sanctuary where they can let their hair down. If a man attempts to join this very sacred ritual, women will unanimously reject him. Why? Because otherwise the truth will be broken immediately and some of the members will start rearming themselves by changing attitudes and checking makeup to charm the maverick. Let's reverse the situation and have the women ask to join a fraternity. Unlike sorority meetings, in most cases, men will always welcome the women with open arms and even ask her to bring her female friends to join the party. Why is that? Because men have formed a multi-domain horizontal society since the dawn of civilization, while women have remained in a single domain and sometimes double helix dual domain vertical society. Initially, the female hierarchy formed a fertility contest based on youth and fairness. If you were young and fair, you would be in high demand among men, increasing the likelihood of mating with the most desirable partner. This harsh competition inspired stories like Cinderella, Rapunzel, and Snow White. However, these fables obscured the truth from reality in order to avoid antagonizing the family market. The harsh competition among women persisted even within the family. The battle of the generations is rampant even to this day among sisters and between mothers and daughters. However, at the dawn of our civilization, female society created another hierarchy to have set the imbalance and the harsh reality of aging in order for former princesses who enjoy the glory of being the alpha but were driven out of the market due to aging to remain in power and retain their influence women established a different hierarchy called status this hierarchy based on status and brand allows those who were once prized for their youth and fairness a second chance to rule and maintain their influence this cultural evolution led to the development of fashion and the caste system, which became the origin of discrimination and racism. In the animal kingdom, mammals and primates tested different tactical business models for survival. The most successful model that proliferated became the dominant model. In Homo sapiens, the hunter-gatherer model forced men to form a multi-domain system where each individual brought their talents and skill sets to the table to achieve goals like hunting woolly mammoth. If I were to ask to hunt one, I wouldn't be able to do it alone. I would need partners who are good at setting traps, someone skilled with spears and arrows, and others with the strengths to carry the meat. 
Men preferred horizontal society because they didn't have the luxury to discriminate against one another. Like attorneys, soldiers, and a medical doctor, there's nothing to compete with but to collaborate. Men only compete when they share the same domain. Therefore, most of the male hierarchies are the result of female influence based on status and brand. The racism and discrimination we find today are somewhat attributed to female competition and the vertical society they have formed. Otherwise, the hierarchy we see today is the product of centralization and functionality, which brought us efficiency and growth. The family is the smallest cog in the wheel of our civilization, and it all begins with women. When women bring hierarchy and unhealthy competition into the family, the family becomes dysfunctional. If the children are constantly at risk of being exposed to their mother's A, postpartum depression, B, menstrual cycle, and C, mother unconsciously passing on the protocols of her own dysfunctional family, and D, if maternal envy is playing a part in her parenting, the vicious cycle of dysfunctionality will be perpetuated because it affects both sons and daughters. This is why we need to bring in a third party to support both children and the mother. Data shows that children who were brought up in a dysfunctional family tend to have lower self-esteem and self-loathing attitude toward life unconsciously. If 95% of your behavior is subject to your unconscious mind, you will unknowingly unconsciously try to punish yourself by putting yourself in an unfavorable situation, whether it be at work or in a relationship. Just like cancer, it's part of you, but it will consume you from the inside. This is typically seen in women repeatedly date someone undesirable, constantly hurt themselves, or in men who unconsciously engage in rogue activities that could eventually lead to their downfall. The troublemakers and risk takers, including some extreme sports challengers who engage in a Freudian death wish, are typically unconscious self aiders Self-mutilation, which includes risk cutting, massive tattoos, and plastic surgery is also a manifestation of self-loathing. Even the most successful entertainers or the wealthiest individuals can still face downfall eventually if they have such a background. Dysfunctional families have contributed to crime and social disorder and can be compounded into conflict and war. We need to promote self-love and higher self-esteem to counter this trend. And it all starts from the family unit. I'm currently working on building a parenting robot that could change the way we raise our children. If we could change this, we can change the way we are and put an end to conflict and war once and for all. Thank you.